Great. So with that, I'd love to introduce to you all formally, Josh Rogan. He is the author of Chaos Under Heaven, which is a really good book. I read it cover to cover last spring when it came out. I cited it in uh, various research papers for my classes. He's a Washington Post columnist. He appears frequently on CNN. So be nice to him. Be nice. <laughs> I know that we're not a CNN crowd here, but uh, Mr. Rogan really, when it comes to uh, international affairs, is one of the best writers in the business, I would say. And and just to add to that, oh, Sam, I apologize, Sam. Let me um, quickly make you co-host of the meeting now. I was not aware of that. So we'll just handle that logistical thing quick only because if um, if Sam's not a co-host, I'm going to have to switch back and forth between hosting this and moderating it and doing logistics. So, okay, so Sam's a co-host. Sam, feel free to make anyone else a host if you can. If not, you know, just take it from here. Um, so with that, though, sorry to interrupt that back to Mr. Rogan's introduction. Um, really, uh, Josh, you're the first writer that I really follow your column specifically. Like, of course, I'll read the New York Times, I'll read the Wall Street Journal, and there'll be writers who reappear frequently because they write about things that I'm interested in. Uh, for example, like Paul Krugman, even though I don't agree with a lot of things he says, but those people kind of reoccur frequently. But you're the first journalist or, or opinion columnist where I really look and I go to your author's page every couple of days. And I'm like, I wonder what you know, Josh is saying about this topic. So it's super cool to do this event and, and we're grateful that you're joining us. Well, thanks, Joe. I'm uh, happy to be with you guys. You know, I uh, spent the last 17 years as a journalist in DC, uh, starting as what basically was a attempt to become a US Japan, a US scholar of Japan relations. And I, I failed. I, I, I lived in Japan for a couple of years. I worked for the Japanese newspaper. I learned Japanese. I studied at the George Washington University at the Elliott School. And, uh, you know, my plan in life was to become a scholar of U.S.-Japan relations. And uh, sure enough, I didn't succeed. <laughs> what, what ended up happening was that, uh, you know, at that time, the and, and to this day, actually, the U.S.-Japan relationship is not really a, a great uh, a, a ladder for professional advancement in Washington. It's one of those relationships that's basically okay. It's not a problem country, so it's not a uh, industry in Washington. And uh, so I, when I was working at the Japanese newspaper in 2004 to 2006, I realized that, you know, actually what most of the people were focused on in that region that we hadn't quite woken up to in Washington yet was the idea that China's rise was something that was going to uh, change the world, that was going to complicate our lives, that was going to uh, be the most important thing in foreign policy and the most, and that the US-China relationship was going to be the most important bilateral relationship in the world. It was accidentally through my interest in Japan that I stumbled upon this story, which is the story of the US-China relationship in the 21st century. And, you know, having not been able to secure a job in the field of studying Japan, I ended up securing different jobs in journalism. And I moved from the Japanese newspaper, the Asahi Shinbun, uh, in 2004 to then Federal Computer Week magazine, which was a trade publication covering the federal government in 2006. Then I worked for Congressional Quarterly, uh, which is a trade publication covering Capitol Hill. Then I worked for Foreign Policy Magazine, which is a trade co publication covering the State Department, then the Daily Beast, then Bloomberg View, and now the Washington Post. And for the last five years, I've been a columnist in the global opinion section of the Washington Post. Um, I also have a side hustle that's I work at, at CNN where I'm a political analyst, which just basically means that when China comes up in the news, you know, they're like, OK, go get Josh, see what he has to say and put him on TV. And then, you know, what happened was over the course of those 17 years that I've spent working as a professional journalist in Washington, slowly but surely, a lot of the uh, town and then, you know, uh, uh, subsequently a lot of different institutions in our society started to come around to this idea that, oh, wait, the rise of China, complex and, uh, you know, convoluted as it is, really is the thing that we have to spend our time and our energy thinking about and talking about and working on. And that's not to say that, you know, um, that, you know, I, I'm asking everyone to agree with everything with what I think about the U.S.-China relationship. It's not that I'm asking everyone to uh, you know, prepare for some sort of confrontation or Cold War or anything like that. My argument simply is that the U.S.-China relationship is the thing that we can't get wrong, is the thing that we can't afford to screw up. It's one of those things that if we get it wrong, very little else matters in our foreign policy and in our conception of, you know, America's role in the world. And, 
I have to say that, like, you know, at, when I signed the contract in 2019 to write a book about the U.S.-China relationship under Trump, I thought that was going to be a really tough argument to make. I thought that I was going to have to write a book that was going to have to convince people that this is the thing we need to focus on, that no matter how much you care about Russia or Afghanistan or Syria, these are things that I care about, uh, that actually we're, we're not spending enough time thinking about what the rise of China and the character and actions and behavior of the Chinese Communist Party means for us, means for our free and open societies. Uh, but then something crazy happened. The pandemic hit in the middle of while I was writing my first book. Uh, excuse me, I'm just going to take a quick drink of water. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. And just to plug the whole time, chaos under yeah. heaven, uh, yeah. Trump Z, and that was a quicker sip than I thought. So go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. Chaos under heaven available now wherever books are sold. But what had happened was, you know, I got to a point in journalism where, you know, I was a columnist and it seemed like, you know, I had a book in me and I was I was I got a contract to write a book about the U.S. China relationship. And in the Trump administration, it was really crazy. I mean, it was crazy for a lot of reasons, but I knew I had a story there. But what I didn't know is that the pandemic, the greatest pandemic in human history, was going to break out uh, in Wuhan, China, and that that was going to have a huge effect on the U.S.-China relationship and vice versa. And now I'm writing the book in quarantine. OK, uh, and I'm, you know, building the plane and flying it at the same time. And, you know, we entered in 2020 a very dystopian phase in our sort of country and our pandemic awareness and our society. There wasn't a lot of information. Or there was a lot of confusion, but I was in a position where I was already writing the book. So I had what I think was a unique perspective on what was going on inside of our government at this time. And with the help of a lot of people inside that government and out, I was able to put a lot of that in the book. And, you know, here we are in 2021 in August, and we're sort of still processing what happened in uh, the Trump years. You know, there's a lot of books coming out about what really went down. And there was a lot of confusion at the time, and it's going to take a lot of time for history to sort it out. Yet at the same time, the U.S.-China relationship is advancing a pace. So I'm still covering it. I'm still writing about it. And I'm still uh, uh, interested in, in sort of f tracking the story as far as it goes. But what I'm here to do tonight is to just say to, to you guys, if you're here at seven o'clock on a Wednesday evening in the Zoom, it seems to me that you care about this issue, right? I've all, I don't need to convince you that the U.S.-China relationship is important. I don't need to convince you that the rise of the Chinese Communist Party is something that affects us, that affects our national security and our freedom and our prosperity and our public health, and that it's a complex problem that we need to have a national discussion about and that we need to deal with sort of in a very complex way. And that is an argument that I don't no longer need to make, mostly because the pandemic has shown everyone that no matter where you are, or what country you're in, all of a sudden your relationship with China and the way that the Chinese Communist Party conducts business, it affects you. There's no doubt about it. There's no way you can say it doesn't. And we could debate how much. So in, in, in a way, uh, the, the, the first argument of the book, which was that this is the most important thing we have to focus on, got overtaken by events. And I think in a way that's good because I think first in our government and then in our society and then in societies all over the world, people are coming around to the realization that this is a really important subject that we have to talk about honestly and, and debate fiercely and, you know, grapple with. And, and, and th so that's, that's great. Now, if I've gotten you that far, then my second argument would be that the strategy that we have is wrong and that the 40 years of uh, an engagement focus, cooperation focus, I'm simplifying it a little bit to be sure we can get into it. But the basic bet that we had that if we engage the Chinese Communist Party as much as possible and ing ingratiated them into our systems as much as possible, that they would liberalize economically. And that would in turn cause them to liberalize politically. And that would in turn solve all, all of our problems and we could live together in peace and harmony. My premise is that that bet has been lost and that we need to speak honestly about that and, and understand the implications of that. And if you have any doubt about that, just look at the pandemic that we're living through because a lot of my reporting now is about what happened in Wuhan in 2019 and 2020, and what continues to happen about the uh, in China covering up the origins of the coronavirus outbreak today. And uh, in my book, there's a lot of reporting about how China conducted itself throughout this pandemic. First, by blackmailing us with the masks and PPE that we needed. Uh, second, by 
injecting a lot of disinformation into our discourse that had a disastrous effect on our public health. Third, by going around the world and pressuring countries and bribing and coercing and forcing countries to do uh, the CCP's political bidding in the middle of a pandemic, not to advance China's interests, but to advance the party's interests. And I think, and we again, we can talk, we can take this in any direction that you want, but my argument is that this should make clear to everyone that the CCP that we're de dealing with in 2021 uh, is not interested in that bet, is not interested in liberalizing that China's development will be determined by the Chinese people one way or the other, and that we have to understand that and be clear eyed about the direction that the CCP is headed and then respond accordingly. And I think that's that the phase we're in, and that gets us to the Biden administration's approach, which again, I'm happy to talk about. But suffice to say, sorry, um, I want to spend this time that we have together addressing the issues that you're interested in. And we can talk about academia, we can talk about Wall Street, we can talk about tech censorship, uh, we can talk about uh, what's going on in our sports and our culture and in the NBA and in Hollywood related to Chinese influence. Um, a big part of my book is about the United Front and the United Front is uh, something that you, you hear a lot about now, but you didn't really hear a lot about at the beginning of the Trump administration. It's this system, this comprehensive, well-organized, well-funded effort uh, led by the party, dates back to Maoist times, uh, that uh, is essentially still described in Maoist terms as attacking the party's enemies by using the party's friends. And what that means is that, um, you know, we have to understand what Chinese influence and Chinese political interference in our institutions and our societies means. And it's a difficult thing to talk about because it's a difficult thing to understand because it's uh, in a sense overt in the sense these are actions that we can see, but in a sense covert in that they conceal a, a clandestine purpose, which is to influence our discussion from the inside. And so there's a huge portion of the book that's all about how Chinese influence operations work. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. Uh, so that's a long way of saying that I think, you know, while I don't have to argue to you guys that this is an important topic because you're here, right? You've taken this time out of your day to hear what I have to say and to consider the fact that my book might be worth reading. I hope you come out of this concluding that it is. Um, I want to be able to answer your question. So I'm going to, you know, stop my spiel and uh, open it up and I, I'm, I'll take it wherever you want to take it. You know, I want to help you uh, uh, understand what I've figured out. And then maybe, you know, we can have a, 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 a back and forth about what it is we do about it. Absolutely. So, Josh, thank you so much for that. And just for the audience, if you could use the raise my hand function to ask questions. So I'll start us off with one or two questions that I think are prudent, and then we'll turn to the raise my hand function from, from you guys. So the first thing, Josh, I want to ask, I want to actually, I guess I'll start with during the pandemic when China threatened our medical supplies, and then I'll work our way back to asking about what's happening in Afghanistan and how that plays into U.S.-China relations. But to revisit, though, what you said about China threatened to cut off the United States' medical supplies. What has the U.S. response been since then? Because I remember from your book, you said, and rightfully so, the Trump administration's hands were tied at the time because they really didn't want to upset China because we just didn't have the capability to switch the supply chains and to make these drugs and pharmaceuticals and masks and all these things that we needed to fight the pandemic uh, by ourselves. So, But since that time, since it has been now essentially over a year that has passed, has the U.S. taken any real concrete steps to redirect those things that are essential for our national security and to make Make them here? Um, and also, have we confronted China? That seems some, something that there needs to be a strong response to. That is close to an act of war, I would say, and there needs to be a really strong response, at least financially and sanctions-wise. So what have been the developments of, on that front, and do you think they've been appropriate thus far? Do you think they've been enough? <laughs> Got it. Thanks, Joe. That's a lot, a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, let me start with your question about the early days of the pandemic. Now, Again, this was something that I was able to report in a kind of unique way because I was writing the book in the early days of the pandemic and I was interviewing dozens of firsthand sources. And what I found and what I wrote was that there was a pitch battle inside the Trump administration between people who believed that this was gonna be a terrible pandemic and based that belief on the idea that the Chinese Communist Party was lying to us from jump about everything all the time. 
and those in the administration who wanted to believe that now it wasn't going to be that bad. OK, and on the first on the former side, you had people like Matt Pottinger, who was the deputy national security advisor who spoke Chinese, who was a reporter in China during the SARS outbreak, who has a wife who's a was a virologist with the CDC, who has a brother who is an epidemiologist in Seattle, where the first outbreak in the U.S. was and who's reading Chinese social media and trying to sound the alarm inside the system that we have a problem here and that the Chinese government was lying about its outbreak and that there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, not only that, you know, they were covering up the details, but that it was a lot worse than they thought. And this kind of leads to why the 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 origin debate in the lab leak versus the natural origin. But I'll get to that in a second. At that same time, you had a lot of Trump's political officials like Mick Mulvaney and Steve Mnuchin and others who were saying, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. You know, we can't take drastic measures to halt the economy in the middle of an election season. And for President Trump, who was not a, a student of you know details himself, this presented a conflict in his head. And he the tiebreaker in his head was his good friend Xi Jinping, the president of China, who lied to the president of the United States and told him in two separate phone calls that I reported in my book that this virus was going to go away in the warm weather and that herbal medicine could treat it and that it was under control and not to worry about it. And Trump started to repeat those lies in public and private. And it had a devastating effect on our reaction in, in those early days. And that doesn't excuse the Trump administration from any of the other mistakes it made. It's just another piece of the puzzle. And what's crazy about that, actually, is that, you know, the the disinformation that the Chinese Communist Party was putting out about the the virus, you know, was parroted by the president of the United States. And that's not to say that, you know, my book is an anti-Trump. It's not. I, my book is I tried to write and be an honest broker, you know, and there are some praise of Trump and there's some criticism of Trump. I don't think all of the criticism of Trump is valid. But in this case, he got snookered by Xi Jinping. And that had a horrible effect on our reaction. Then the Chinese Communist Party went around the world and blackmailed and threatened and coerced every country that dared to speak up about the origins or failed to toe the party line or did anything that they that the CCP thought was uh, offensive in its own perception of its own, you know, insecurity and delicate sensibilities. So, you know, when you, when you think about that, I think, you know, it shows two things. One is that, you know, the the driving force in all of the decision making for the Chinese government at this time was political, right? They, it wasn't about public health. It wasn't about China's economic advancement, although that was part of it. It was mostly about, you know, countries that asked about the origins or countries that were, you know, working with Taiwan on solutions or countries that dared to counteract the party line. And those are the countries that got punished. And this was China's opportunity uh, as a global superpower to show how it would act, how it would treat its uh, uh, its partners, and what it what it did is it blackmailed and coerced them, and insulted them, and devastated their economies in the middle of a pandemic for no good reason. And I think that actually backfired. That actually caused a lot of countries, including the UK, Netherlands, Australia, to really become more anti CCP than they otherwise would have been. You know, now when you ask about our reaction. You know, when I was talking to very, very senior Trump administration officials at the time, again, sitting in my own basement, <laughs> writing this book in the quarantine, it became clear to me that they were conflicted by the need to get our masks and their desire to tell the Chinese uh, what's what. And in the end, they had to succumb to the blackmail because Americans were dying and the Chinese government held our masks over our head, you know, like our factories in China, but they just nationalized them. And that did lead to a lot of discussion about reorienting supply chains and de limited decoupling and, and you know what it is that we're going to need to do in case there's another pandemic which the odds are actually 100 percent over time uh but then that they lost the election and all that uh kind of intellectual knowledge kind of was discarded you know i don't I, if you guys followed what happened during the transition in washington i was here it's was, it a little messy okay there was a you know, they stormed the Capitol. The president wouldn't like he wouldn't even acknowledge that he lost. So it was like there was no way to have a transition. And a lot of things fell through the cracks. And one of the things that I document in the book is that at the end of 2020, 
when Trump realized that his good friend Xi Jinping had conned him, because eventually it did dawn on him that he had been snookered, uh, he got really angry. Okay, and then he released his national security team to take every sort of anti-CCP measure off the shelf and just launch it into the abyss. And now we're talking about like, you know, executive order against TikTok and what what have you. And this had a huge, you know, sort of effect on pushing the U.S.-China relationship over the tipping point. And but the problem was, of course, the Trump administration people were rushing to do this before they had to leave office. So they did it in a haphazard and ad hoc way. So they weren't able to actually achieve any of their goals. All they were able to do was put a bunch of points on the board and then hand off this kind of messy policy to the Biden people who are now sorting through it and are trying to do a, a honest job of it more or less, but they don't really know what they're looking at and they don't talk to the Trump people and they don't, there was no connectivity and there was no transition. So it's kind of a disaster. And so, you know, that's all to say that the way that the Chinese Communist Party handled itself through the pandemic has been a series of own goals. You know, they've been bullying and aggressive and really cruel and exacerbating the suffering of billions of people. You know, look at the vaccines. I mean, they charged the international system, COVAX, the UN system for vaccines, and the vaccines don't even work. You know what I mean? The US is giving millions of billions of vaccines to people all over the world. And the Chinese are like, okay, you can have our vaccines, but we're going to charge you market rate. By the way, they don't work, you know? And that's the kind of China as a global world power that people are seeing. Again, I think that is a, 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 you know, a real own goal by the Chinese Communist Party. The problem is that our system hasn't responded. The problem, in my view, is that we haven't mounted a, a reasonable alternative. We haven't gone to any of these other countries and said, we have a package that is better. You know, here are, here's our vaccines. Here's our supply line idea. Here's our solution for, uh, you know, 5G or silicon or whatever it is, lithium batteries, whatever it is that you could think of. And at the same time, we have a Wall Street class that's rushing to shove as much U.S. investor money into the hands of Chinese companies as quick as they can before the gates shut, before the, the hammer comes down. What the Wall Street firms are doing is they're doubling down. And that's really the largest transfer of wealth and influence and power to, from our system to theirs. And that's a whole other topic. We can get into that if you want to. But that's a long way of saying, I think that, you know, the Chinese government has made a ton of mistakes, but we have uh, failed to cap capitalize on those. Absolutely. So uh, just to add on to that quickly, I completely agree that a lot of the risk in investing in these Chinese companies with American money. And I so I think you wrote a good article about it saying that the U.S. regulators need to better protect American investors because these companies aren't properly audited and there's all types of volatility. And we recently saw that with G's crackdown on the technology companies and the education companies. So certainly that's a big risk. Uh, one more question from me, and then we'll start to turn it to the, uh, the Q&A from the broader audience. I think we have to touch on and we, we have to talk about what happened in Afghanistan uh, in the context of US-China relations. So of course, there it is a tragedy. 12 American service members died. It's a sad situation. It's a debacle. It's a tragedy. That being said, it's, it's a representation, I would say, of perhaps the past two decades of failed foreign policy in many ways. All those things aside, as it relates to US-China relations, Geographically, Afghanistan is very close to China. Uh, Afghanistan is in possession of $1 trillion worth of rare earth minerals that China needs to make all types of military equipment and uh, you know, environmentally friendly energy and all different things that the economy seems to be moving towards. How does the debacle, both from a propaganda standpoint, when you see the horrific images and the things that have been happening and the videos of people clinging to the planes and, and falling off. The, on one hand, the propaganda and just the imagery of it. And then on the other hand, the very real fact that we've now conceded this land that is very geographically close to China and has all these assets and a military base that was also right on the uh, pretty much very close within a few hundred miles of China's borders. How does that play into the broader competition between US and China and how much of a disadvantage do you think that puts us at? Sure. You know, I've written a bunch about this in the last three weeks. And, uh, you know, it, my position on the withdrawal from Afghanistan is pretty well established. You know, I argued the minority position, actually, which is that uh, what we've done 
and what the Biden administration has now did in the last you know month or so uh, has made the problem worse, has made the terrorism problem worse, has made the uh, situation in Afghanistan worse in ways that will come back to haunt us. Uh, I don't think you have to look much past 2011 withdrawal from Iraq to, to understand how that works. And, you know, I get that the political uh, uh, winds were blowing in a certain direction. And I believe that the U.S. government over many, many years failed to be honest with the American people about what was achievable in Afghanistan. That's undeniable, right? My position is we, sh- we overpromised and underdelivered. Of course, the American people want out of Afghanistan. I, uh, that's indisputable and really unarguable. But what I'm saying is that by doing it the way that they did at the time that they did, they've actually made the situation much, much worse. And, you know, you have this political imperative to get to end the forever wars, uh, but there's also outcomes and those outcomes are, playing out on the ground and they're gruesome and they're going to they're going to they're going to require uh future generations to sort out but how that relates to china is actually pretty simple you know we we think you know the biden administration thinks that it's it's a matter of withdrawing from certain regions to focus on the china challenge but there are other people inside the biden administration that think that no actually the china challenge takes place all over the world that we are actually in a strategic competition that is bigger than us, that it's not really about the United States versus China, that it's really about the international response to China as it rises. And that means that in every continent, we have to be cognizant of what's going on. And that means that when we see the Chinese Communist Party welcome the Taliban, that means we have to understand why that's happening, that how can a, a, a regime in Beijing that is committing a genocide against Muslims celebrate a fanatical Muslim regime. Well, that's because they're both psycho, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they're both regimes that are based on the principles of dictatorship and totalitarianism and uh, you know control over human beings. And these are things that are, we believe in our system are bad, that we actually are for the other things, which are freedom and democracy and human rights and journalism and civil society and the rule of law. And that that's the greater struggle. So, you know, I understand the politics of Afghanistan and America. I understand why the president made his decision. But as far as it concerns the China challenge, I think the most important thing to think about is that in this is a clear signal uh, to lots of other countries that America's commitment to these values is limited, that our patience is limited, that our resolve is limited, that our perseverance is limited. And it's impossible for people in places like Hong Kong and Taiwan, not to think about that, okay? I don't blame them for thinking about that. And, you know, on a, what you mentioned about like the sort of the rare earth minerals and all of that stuff, sure, yes. I think that, you know, when we, when America retreats, the void will be filled by bad actors, including the Chinese Communist Party. But I'm not as worried about China digging up the lithium in Kandahar, because I think that's, like, you know, one discrete problem. What I'm worried about is actually what we've done to our relationships, not just with the Afghans, but with all of the other countries in the world. And I spent the last three weeks just dealing with diplomats from countries in Europe and Asia and South America who all have the same exact reaction. Like, oh my God, how could you guys screw this up so bad? And we didn't realize you were this incompetent. And don't you understand that you've just undermined your your larger argument, not the Afghanistan argument, the larger argument about is America going to be the leader of a resurgence in the push for the things that we believe in, the values and interests that we are trying to defend. And if you see the China challenge in those terms, then the sacrifice is clear. But if you see it in the narrow, uh, you know, perspective of, oh, well, you know, did the Afghanistan intervention achieve its goals? Well, then that's a totally different question. I understand. Gotcha. Thank you, Josh. So we'll go first to Robert and then to Cohen. Thank you. Uh, After World War II, there was a massive uh, influx of federal funding into United States higher education. But to prevent it from becoming a uh, sort of centralized dictatorship, there were things like uh, meritocracy, uh, 
grant issuing peer review panels. Uh, it was very uh, decentralized in that, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't like a small cabal running basic research in the United States and academia. Academia then sort of relied upon that as the model for how uh, the search for knowledge could, could be achieved under uh, federal funding. In contrast, the CCP seems to be the exact opposite, yet we have a number of entanglements, including Cornell, uh, trying to uh, go into joint ventures with China-based uh, institutions of higher education that are highly tied into the CCP. How do you see this, this playing out? Because at least in the West, we think of academia as having to be independent of, of, of the political parties and the party power structure. Yeah, thank you for asking that. You know, there's a, a subchapter in my book about this where I sort of trace the avenues of CCP influence on American campuses, right? The Confucius Institutes, uh, the, the Chinese Student and Scholars Associations, the donations, the research partnerships. There's a lot of avenues for influence and money on the campuses. And, you know, I've written several of these stories about sort of the tension that that presents to academic communities. But, Attention between American competing values in our society that we want to preserve openness, collaboration, national security, um, you know, uh, preserving the freedom for even our guests, you know, should our Chinese students be, be protected when they're on our soil? How do we do that? You know, is the money corrupting? You know, these are all sort of issues that were sort of talked about in hushed tones for a long time inside these academic institutions that spilled out into the public discourse, often in chaotic and inconvenient ways. You know, I've always been of the position that transparency is the rule and that, you know, this is kind of an issue that academic institutions need, the, need to establish some relationship with the law enforcement community to navigate, you know, and of course, in our society, one of the differences and one of the advantages, I think, is that our, we have independent institutions and that they defend that independence fiercely and rightly. But at the same time, when it comes to an organized United Front effort to sort of penetrate those institutions and turn them against our interest in favor of our adversaries interests, well, then that's a problem that we sort of have to deal with also on a policy level. And what I documented in the book was a lot of good faith attempts by the law enforcement community, mostly good faith attempts uh, to sort of grapple with this problem at universities, but it, it never re really went well. And when the FBI comes and knocking at your door, a lot of these academic institutions didn't like that. And mistakes were made and targeting happened and that's terrible. And you know we have to avoid making this into an issue about Chinese people or the Chinese ethnicity. And all of those considerations are complicated. Uh, but when I wrote the book, what I didn't know, so I tried to, approach that honestly in in other words to say that you know that we have a real problem here of uh just billions and billions of dollars of chinese communist party united front money pouring into our campuses in all sorts of shady ways and 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 that causes a lot of really messed up outcomes uh, that that have been documented and continue to be documented and the government is playing a, a cat and mouse game like they'll make rules about confucius institutes but then schools will just change the names or something like that and all of a sudden, you know, evade the law and all the rules on disclosure are just flaunted. Nobody knows where all the money is going. And, you know, it's really, uh, you know, the research institutions, when they go and scoop up a bunch of these thousand talent program people and, uh, you know, are they doing that based on the, the level of the threat? It's hard to tell. And then the Biden administration will throw away the cases because of concerns from their progressive left. So it's really a, a part of the China challenge that, uh, we haven't been able to talk about as a community, honestly, because of the politics involved. But what I didn't know when I published the book is that actually the Chinese Communist Party was going to make a move on this, right? And if you look at what's happened over the last few weeks, actually, uh, you know, the, the Beijing has changed its approach to how it deals with education, right? What are the rules? Okay, now a huge clampdown on foreign tutoring companies. That's billions of dollars of investment. That's a big hit on Wall Street. 
Now, I'm sure there are a lot of Chinese parents who are glad they don't have to pay for, pay for tutoring. That's not the point. The point is that the party intervened to completely change the way their education system works. Then they, oh, only, Chinese kids can only play an hour of video games a day, right? That's a huge thing that shows you is another data point that shows you where the party is going towards control, towards management, right? And then you look at, oh, Xi Jinping thought is now mandatorily taught from K through college, every class, every day, okay? And then you look at, you know, the space for uh, social science inside Chinese universities, it's totally closing down. Now, these are uncomfortable things to think about because it leads you to the obvious conclusion that the way that the Com Communist Party is treating its own education system is changing fast in a way that we didn't anticipate. If you had told me 10 years ago that they were gonna say, Chinese kids can't get tutoring or play video games. I was, you would say that was crazy. You know, that, that we wouldn't have thought that they would do that. So the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping is becoming more totalitarianism, more totalitarian, more controlling, more socialist. And this of course has an impact on all of our collaborations. Now, what I say is that we have to react to that change. Now, I'm not saying that I have the magic bullet solution. I'm just saying that if we don't admit that that's what's happening, then we're ignoring the problem. And that only makes it worse. That actually makes it more dangerous. That makes us more susceptible and that makes us more vulnerable. So we, you know, that's not, we have to find a way to preserve these collaborations and to, you know, make sure we have, we're, we don't become the thing that we're fighting, a closed society that treats foreigners poorly. And we have to welcome Chinese students to our campuses and ensure that they have basic rights when they're on our, on our soil. And that none of that is easy, but I think we're just sort of caught into a, a, a sort of a, a more rudimentary level of discourse where we're just talking about, do we have a problem or don't we have a problem? And I think the prerequisite for solving the problem is admitting that you have one. And I think that, you know, the, <clears throat> what's going on inside China is actually very ominous because if you take it to its logical conclusion, it's going to make all of these interactions much, much more delicate and dangerous for those people, you know, for those people in China who want to, you know, engage in, to, in the intellectual marketplace. And we have to understand that they're in this terrible situation. That's going to get worse for them. We have to be empathetic to that. But first of all, we have to protect ourselves. And so I say first things first is that, you know, we find all of the Chinese Communist Party United Front money and we expose it. And then we at least know what we're dealing with. And then we can sort of sort through how we continue these collaborations in a way that doesn't sacrifice our values and interests uh, in deference to their political agenda, because that's a slippery slope that we really can't afford to go down. Just briefly, not to cut off Colin's question, but just a, a, a quick question. Uh, do you think to some extent it's self-defeating, Josh, the fact that Xi Jinping is kind of cracking down on these Chinese businesses and limiting academic freedom within China? Do you think that's something that, as we've seen, because it's turning public opinion against him and against the CCP will backfire? Or do you think that there's just too much distance between us and there's just too, it's just too far gone? There's just too many entrenched interests within the United States and other Western countries that will just work too hard to maintain these relationships? You know, I, what I think is that we're in the heyday of the Xi Jinping era, okay? He won't live forever, but this is when he is at his peak. He's got the mo he's consolidating power. There's no dissent tolerated. The security state has melded in the MSS with the party and with the Xi Jinping faction of the party in a way that, again, I don't think we predicted. And, you know, what that means is that, you know, this is all heading in one direction based on all of the data and based on all of everything that they say and that we can see. And to deny that is just naive. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that, you know, uh, not that the Chinese people are gonna rebel against Xi Jinping, not at all. That actually what, what, what happens, what history shows and what the cultural revolution showed us is that what, what manifests itself inside China subsequently inevitably manifests itself in the Chinese Communist Party's foreign policy. We, if we look to go, what's going on with inside China, that will be a, a leading indicator of what we're gonna see coming at us. 
And in fact, I think the record bears that out fairly consistently. So that's why I say that, you know, we have to be careful not to exaggerate the threat. You know, we, we, we there's a chance, there, we, there's a risk of overreaction and all of that stuff. But at the same time, if you look at what's going on inside China, it should tell us what's coming at us. And that's a, a, a Chinese Communist Party leadership that is increasingly totalitarian, increasingly controlling of all the aspects of its citizens' lives, increasingly telling us to go screw ourselves when we complain about, I don't know, hiding the origin of a pandemic, corrupting our markets, interfering in our politics, you spying on our technology, you name it. Okay. And that the again, that's the prerequisite for having an honest conversation about how we deal with it. In other words, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And while we should leave the door open for the Chinese Communist Party to change its behavior, uh, we can't let that stop us from changing our own behavior to protect ourselves. Absolutely. Colin? Yeah, hi. Um, my question is about Taiwan. So every time we have like a, an issue you know, abroad where our credibility is challenged or where China makes some kind of you know, statement or move, we have all these, you know, like worrisome statements about Taiwan where everyone's like, oh, you know, we got to demonstrate our credibility. You know, people are worried. China is getting more aggressive. Um, I guess my question is how, how aggressive do you think China really is? And is Taiwan seriously at risk, you know, in 10 years or is that all just talk? Sure. No, I believe uh, Taiwan is at uh, grave risk, but not at risk of a military invasion of little green men per se. And I think there's an overfocus in Washington on the scenario of some sort of marine landing of Chinese troops who are going to start shooting at uh, Taiwanese uh, civilians. But I think that's actually uh, one of the least likely scenarios. And, you know, if we look at what happened in Hong Kong, the playbook was very simple, right? The Xi Jinping threatened and mounted a military invasion threat, but he didn't actually use it. He used all of the other tools of CCP power to co-opt and uh, the government, the economy, the justice system, the media, and then uh, you know put his neck on the civil society, arrest all of the people who didn't salute, and essentially strangled Hong Kong autonomy until it was dead. Okay, that's what he did. Now, given that 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 was so successful, that the international community basically just let it happen, did let it happen, continues to let it happen. Why would you mess with that plan? Why would you? It worked. It was a, a rousing success from his perspective. And that's what I see happening in Taiwan. And that's what I hear when I talk to my friends in Taiwan who are not interested in becoming uh, uh, Chinese citizens. Uh, they say that it's political interference, business class interference. They bought up 80 percent of the media. They're promoting certain candidates, disinformation, fake news. All of that stuff, propaganda, um, you know, malign influence, spying, all of that stuff. So I think that's what that's what Xi Jinping will do if he can is to turn Taiwan. When when he made his latest speech, he said, I call on, you know, compatriots in China and Taiwan to help us. He wants to displace the DPP without a shot fired. And then he will have his goal of turning Taiwan. Now, that's he, he reserves the right to attack. But the whole point is that we're supposed to be deterring him from doing that. And we're not doing that, obviously, because he keeps getting more and more aggressive. So, again, I know I've heard about the escalation ladder. I'm, I'm familiar with the argument that, like, you know, uh, um, that we need to just allow China a greater severe of influence. Uh, but I think history shows us that that actually doesn't work, that actually appeasement has the opposite effect you want it to. And actually, when it comes to totalitarian regimes that are externally aggressive, internally repressive, and interfering in freeing up in societies, their appetite grows with the eating. And I think that our ambiguity in Taiwan is uh, dangerous. And our allies know that. And uh, after uh, the military deterrent is rendered uh, silly, which will be a matter of years, I don't know how many, uh, we're going to be in a lot of trouble and the people of Taiwan are going to be in a lot of trouble. And uh, so I, I'm, uh, that's not exactly a cheery assessment, but I think that's where we are. Great. Thank you, Josh. Next, we go to Keenan, who 
is an international student and really is a primary source to, to history. So Keenan, go ahead, please. You're up, you gotta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so hi, I'm Keenan. So I'm an international student from Hong Kong. So, so, so like since the Hong Kong protests broke out in 2019, I've actually engaged in like activism within my campus by like uh, quite a bit, few different means, but one of them is like by putting up these posters about Hong Kong protests uh, or, or like, or like uh, re relevant issues like around the campus. And like actually like many of my posters like have been torn off by like, by like suspected like Chinese Communist Party supporters. And, and I've been putting up posters for almost two years now and like, like, like most of our posters have been torn off in like within one to two weeks time. So, so, so like, it, it, so like, like, it, they, like, like even during the pandemic, like it was a little bit less, but still like they have been torn off quite frequently. And, and so like, uh, like, like, like and, and like, I actually have friends who from like other, other American universities, like they have actually faced like, like physical threats from like Chinese Communist Party supporters while they were hosting events about the Hong Kong protests. It was in 2019, but still, like, 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 since like the, the problem is that like, like, obviously Hong Kong is like has like seven million population, while like China has like 1.3 billion. So like naturally, like the amount of Hong Kong students from Hong Kong, like, would be much less than those from, from like China. And unfortunately, like, 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 seems like many of those students from China are, are like kind of like practically brainwashed by the Chinese Communist Party. So like, like one thing, like, like the first question I have is like, is like, I'm wondering if there's like any way on like a foreign policy level that we can like tackle the problem of, of like, of like Chinese students practically trying to like take away our freedom of speech here within American campuses. And, and also a second question that I have, that I want to ask. So actually like, like you kind of answered part of it, like, while answering Kulin's question, but uh, like, 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 I'm still kind of wondering, like, like, what, like, to what level do you think America should like, should do to like, protect Taiwan, to like protect Hong Kong, and also like, save East Turkestan or Tibet, like, 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 to what extent should America go go towards like protecting these places, like, 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 in in like the more unlikely scenario, like for example, in the more like unlikely scenario where. China actually invades Taiwan. Like, do you think like America should like go to war and and, and like and obviously like it, like going to war would have significant consequences. But do you think this is worth it? And and as for like Hong Kong, like East Turkestan, Tibet, like 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 what means do you think that America can do? And like to and, like to what extent we can help? Like America can help out like these places. Like that. Like 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 if like America like like declares that like. They recognize Hong Kong as an independent country, or declares like, like East Turkestan or Tibet as an independent country. Like, like, do you think like America can do something like that? And do you think America can, like, can bear the consequences of doing so? Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, thank you so much. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with uh, a lot of brave young uh, Hong Kong uh, democracy and freedom activists uh, like yourself, and. Uh, you know, trying to tell their stories, trying to support, elevate their voices and trying to argue that the you know, United States government had a moral and strategic interest and obligation uh, to push back against uh, the crackdown. And, you know, I for a lot of reasons, some of which are in the book, that didn't happen. And, um, you know, Trump didn't care about Hong Kong. You know, Pompeo cared enough to make a bunch of speeches. And nothing was done. And a lot of the damage tra tragically won can never be undone. And I think there's a good faith debate about what do we do now with Hong Kong? Should we, you know, deny Hong Kong its ability to be a financial hub, considering the fact that it no longer has the rule of law as we know it. It no longer has uh, financial uh, institution credibility as we understand it in the West. And I, I know that a lot of my friends inside the Hong Kong uh, democracy and freedom movement disagree about that. I happen to think that, unfortunately, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is going to try to have its cake and eat it too. They're going to try to crush Hong Kong's freedom and democracy and still use it to funnel money, to launder money hand over fist uh, from the West into China, which is what it is. It's a place for Ch Ch corrupt Chinese companies to IPO and raise Wall Street funding and capital and 
you know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, how does a, a superpower with a, a currency that doesn't work in the international system go around the world buying up companies and industries and continents and countries? It's because they have this thing called Hong Kong. So I, I think there's a, a, a tension inside the Biden administration now about what to do about Hong Kong. Should, you know, is it like strangling your friend to save them from drowning? Or is it something that we just have to understand is forever changed? But, you know, I, for one, think that we need to keep our attention on Hong Kong, but also learn the lessons. And that's what we're talking about with the Taiwan example. Um, you know, on campuses, you know, my experience has been that the easy thing to do for admit for university leadership for administrators and boards and presidents and deans is to take the money. It's much easier to take the money. Okay. That's what they've been doing for all these years. Free money. And hey, you know, if there's a little censor self-censorship, the right self-censorship is the first part. And then, well, you know, we don't want to offend Chinese students' sensibilities. So we'll ban the Dalai Lama, something like that. And then it gets it's full out to, oh, well, we can't even talk about things in class because all the Chinese students are reporting on each other. And I think that's uh, terrible. And I think that's something we can't stand. So, you know, my in my reporting, what I found is the only thing that these university leadership organizations respond to is public pressure. OK, that's why I focus on transparency, because it's not targeting China. Right. There are lots of other countries that are dumping corrupt money into our universities. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Russia, Iran, just to name a few, right? So, you know, to take away the uh, ability of those who support these corrupt activities to claim that we're targeting China, all we have to say is that we need a lot more transparency and accountability about all the money flowing into our institutions. That includes the Confucius Institutes, but not limited to them. And I think that would solve a big part of the problem. And then when we see instances of self-censorship or uh, um, crackdowns on academic freedom, we have to name them and shame them. That's the business I'm in, okay? That works, but there are too many to really track at one time. And this is exactly what the United Front is meant to do. It's meant to put its agenda through our institutions, through our, in American voices and in American, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 discourse in a way that doesn't, reveal what's really going on, which is that, of course, they would like to neuter our civil society uh, uh, to, to prevent the CCP from receiving criticism. I think it's a it's a essentially an unsolvable problem, but one that if we are vigilant about, we can mitigate at least. Great. Thank you, Josh. We have time for one more question if someone has it. So if anyone wants to uh... Raise your hand, do it now, forever hold your peace, as they say. So we'll give it a couple of uh, seconds. And uh, yeah, other than that, oh, Sam, good. Okay, go ahead, Sam. Thank you, Keenan. thank you. Yes, and, and thank you so much, um, Mr. Rogan, for taking uh, this time um, to speak with us on a very important issue. Uh, my question is on, um, just the current state of uh, what's going on in uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, and also um, to underground um, Chinese Christians um, in China. And um, given that um, we now um, unequivoc have unequivocal proof that the Chinese Communist Party is engaging in genocide and US officials have admitted as such, what um, steps, either um, diplomatically or um, other steps, uh, can the U.S. take and should the U.S. take to deter China from engaging in any further action? I know that there's been talk of boycotting uh, the Olympic Games that are slated to happen, but what are um, some other actions that the U.S. should take? Thank you for asking about this. You know, this is the uh, part of the U.S. Uh, China policy that is the most tragic and the most screwed up. Uh, because you're right, you know, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration asserted that there's a genocide going on in 
Xinjiang, which I agree with, you know, even if you don't, people quibble with the legal definition of genocide, right? The legal definition is essentially two parts, right? Uh, to, uh, to act with the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. Now, there's two parts of that. One is to destroy the group in whole or in part. And the second is the intent. So what the genocide deniers will say, and you'll see them all over the place saying this, is that, oh, well, we don't know the intent. Maybe they're just uh, committing mass atrocities and crimes against humanity against the Uyghurs, but it, we don't know that they intend the genocide. Now, I think that's horseshit because just through the practices that and the stories of forced sterilization, uh, forced IUD implementation, forced abortion, separation of children from their parents, all of that stuff. That's as clear of an intent as I can imagine, you know, whatever the statistic may be. So I think it's a disingenuous argument, but setting aside the legal question over genocide, what we see on the ground is that the international community has now acknowledged that these horrible mass atrocities are happening on our watch. And still there's very little action, almost no action. Okay. And, you know, the U S government has done a little bit, but not really much. Right. Oh, uh, we, you know, sanctions on uh, cotton from Xinjiang and sanctions on, uh, you know, forced labor products and uh, a couple of other targeted Magnitsky sanctions. These are parts of the thing. These are some of the things that happened at the end of the Trump administration in the race while they were getting pushed out the door that I was talking about earlier when nobody knew what was going on, when literally nobody was at the White House and, you know, the Capitol was being overrun. Yeah, we got a few sanctions on the books. OK, great. You know, the Biden people, when it came down, when the first test that they really had was over the solar sanctions. And these are sanctions on solar companies that are using forced labor, which if they're operating in Xinjiang, they almost certainly are. And what happened was that they, they it, there was a struggle inside the Biden administration. And they ended up issuing sanctions on one of the solar companies, one of the Chinese solar companies, Hanshin Solar. It happens to be the biggest one. It's actually a very significant action in practice, but they're not implementing it. And there's all of this pushback from the climate change people who are saying, oh, well, we have we need solar panels to meet our climate change goals. And then the national security people say, well, we can't meet our climate change goals on the backs of human slavery because that's screwed up. And also, did you know that the only reason that the Chinese control the solar panel industry is because they're powering all of that manufacturing with dirty coal plants, which totally undermines the whole point of the thing in the first place. And that's an unresolved question inside the U.S. government. Now, around the world, there's even less uh, interest in doing anything about the genocide. And the Muslim world is silent for understandable reasons that's run by a bunch of human rights abusers. All right. What's Saudi Crown Prince MBS going to say about abusing Muslims? He's, he's you know, a... Uh, uh, a dictator with blood on his hands. Okay. So he can't be the champion for the Muslim uh, human rights cause. Okay. And so, and then, you know, basically there's just inertia and that's tragic. And I think what we're seeing is that that is actually emboldening the Chinese communist party to expand these practices because now we're seeing concentration camp like structures pop up in Tibet, the reverse importing. Remember they started in Tibet with all the horrendous stuff the monitoring, the neighborhood watches, the surveillance, you know, you drive from your house to work. And if you, it took you too long to get there, the police come knocking at the door. What happened to that other half hour of your life? That kind of like Orwellian stuff that started in Tibet. It was expanded to concentration camps in Xinjiang, and now it's being reverse imported. And when you look at Inner Mongolia and the crackdowns that are happening there in terms of education and uh, this and 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 freedom of expression. Well, they're next, okay. And then you look at the facilities that they're the prisons that they're building in Hong Kong. Well, all of a sudden you get a very scary picture. So, our lack of uh, action is, uh, you know, setting in, into a, a, a effect a a course of events that is going to lead to a vast, in my estimation, a vast expansion of the concentration camps, and. That's, uh, you know, the greatest tragedy of the century so far. And I don't have a good answer for that other than everyone who's horrified by that uh, needs to keep talking about it and 
survivors will continue to tell their stories and eventually enough, hopefully enough people will be horrified to push our government into action. But to be honest, that hasn't happened yet. Well, Josh, I want to say again, thank you very much for joining us. This is, I think that in the history of this organization, which dates back to the Reagan administration, you're the most prestigious guest that we've had for an event. We've had federal judges, we've had conservative speakers, but you're really somebody who is a mainstream writer who appears on um, everything ranging from CNN to, to Steve Bannon show. So you have an, to Joe Rogan, so you have an interesting array of things. And, and it's also a very serious topic. So I think you're someone who brings a lot of liveliness and energy and, and open dialogue to a really serious and important discussion. And I think this is the proper setting for it because a lot of these people will go on to become leaders of industry or policy leaders and uh, hopefully acquire positions of power that they could use for the greater good. And I think that the knowledge that you've, you've given to all of us is very valuable here. So I want to plug your book one more time. So it's Chaos Under Heaven, Trump G in the Battle for the 21st Century. And it's fair to say number one bestseller, right? Was it number one in some? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> definitely on Amazon, it was number one bestseller. I'm sure of that. <laughs> and it was definitely on the bestsellers list for, for others. So, And uh, you can find Josh's columns too at the Washington Post. And uh, Josh, really, it's a great honor. So thank you so much. And I hope we can continue communication going forward. Well, thanks, Joe. I mean, I wrote the book because I think this is a conversation that everyone needs to have, not just the China hands, not just the Washington elite foreign policy establishment. It affects all of us. So, uh, you know, I welcome all of you into the conversation. Look forward to keeping in touch. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Uh, go to the CornellReview.org. And we appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks.